I will be starting in-person classes here in Asheville, North Carolina soon. If you would like to join and attend an in-person class here in Asheville, North Carolina, please click on the Silicon Dojo meetup link down below. Welcome back. As you know, I am Eli the Computer Guy, and in today's class, we're going to be answering the question of what is a computer network? So this is one of those questions that seems very, very, very simple in the beginning, but then as you start delving and getting deeper into the subject, it becomes ever so much more complicated. And one of the big problems you have, especially for new students, is as they start learning the more and more and more complicated things, they start thinking, oh my golly, I will never be able to learn this material, and then they go off to be florists. Remember, the big thing in the technology world is that little principles are all built on top of each other to come up with more complicated principles. So if you understand the basic building blocks and you grow from there, uh, everything will be a hell of a lot easier. If you just try to dive into IPv6 right at this point in time and you don't know what speed is and latency and topologies and all of that type of thing are, well, it's going to seem very, very confusing and it's going to seem very difficult. And frankly, you're going to give up because it's just going to be like, oh, how can I possibly ever learn this information? So what we're going to be doing today is we're just going to be starting off with an introduction. We're going to be talking about uh, the media that actually connects uh, computers and servers and all that type of stuff together. We're going to be talking about topologies. We're going to be talking a little bit about protocols and we're going to give you the basic uh, information that you will need uh, to be able to go on from here and learn more about computer networking. Now to start off at a place that might seem overly simple to begin with, but I swear there's a reason for this, let's really talk about what computer networking is. All computer networking is, is it's creating an infrastructure, creating a way for computer devices to communicate with each other, right? So if you are sitting there and you are watching this video on your computer, most likely you're watching this video on YouTube or you're watching this video with within a web browser of some sort. And basically, networking is what allows your computer to communicate with the server on the internet to be able to bring this uh, video to you and allow your web, web browser to actually be able to play this particular video. Now, when we look at the modern world, things have become a little bit more complicated uh, with networking simply because there are so many computer devices nowadays that do so many tasks. So back when I started uh, in IT and I got my Windows NT 4.0 MCSE, basically there wasn't a lot to computer networking, right? You had your client computer, <laughs> you had your Windows 95 computer that I swear I actually did have to support in the enterprise environment and that connected to a server. Maybe you had a, a network type printer, but that was about it, right? You could share files, you could get emails, you could print to a printer, and that was the long and short of, of what your computer networking experience was. In the modern world though, uh, with the, uh, the, uh, the, the creation of something called IoT, uh, Internet of Things, we are now in a world when, where computer devices are so much more than simply a computer that you sit down at uh, and then printing out to something like a printer, right? You may have a thermostat that is connected to a network. Your car may be connected to your network. The watch that you wear on your arm now, that may be connected to a network. And so all of these devices now have to have some way way to communicate with other computer devices in order to send information uh, so that users can do something with that or to pull information down. Uh, so again, that users, let's say it's a watch, can see that they have an appointment in, in a few minutes, right? And so with modern technology, there are lots of ways to create computer networks. There's lots of different ways that these computer networks are designed. And so really all we're getting at when we're talking about computer networking is when we look at specific devices, computer devices and how those specific computer devices are going to be communicating with each other. Once you grasp that concept, then you start looking at the problems that you're trying to solve for the computer devices that you have, what you're trying to get out of those computer devices, and from there you start building your network infrastructure so that you can actually have those computer devices communicate in a way that is useful for you.
So as we start talking about modern computer networking, it's kind of good to visualize what exactly it is that we're talking about. Because one of the big problems we have with new students is they have an idea in their head of what a subject is, and then they start learning different things about that subject, and then they get confused because what they're learning doesn't match their, their mental image. Again, back when I started in IT, you know, I got my MCSE and NT 4.0 back in 2000. And back then, you know, networks looked a certain way, right? The network was connected to the cloud. When we talk about the cloud, we're just talking about the internet. Uh, you would have a router or modem uh, that basically connected your entire network uh, to the cloud. That would then be connected to a switch. And then from that switch, you would have a lot of networking devices uh, that would be able to communicate over the network. So you may have, you know, five uh, host machines, basically uh, all the uh, individual client computers that you're using. You may have five of those, you may have a thousand of those, those would all be connected uh, to your switch, to your network infrastructure. You might have your uh, network printers that I talked about before. So if somebody wanted to print, basically they would send the print job through the network and then would print out through the network printer. Uh, you would have servers on that network, and your Active Directory server, uh, your file server, your Exchange server, or your SMTP server, but basically, this is what, uh, whoops. There we go. This is what uh, your network would essentially look like. And regardless of where you went, this is always what the network would look like. Maybe you would have an Active Directory cluster. So you would have five Active Directory servers. Maybe you would have some kind of storage cluster. So you'd have multiple storage servers. Maybe you would have database servers. Maybe you'd have different types of servers, that type of thing. But basically, this is what, you know, 99.9% .9 of all networks that you're going to be dealing with looked like. But again, now we are in the IOT world. So we talk about IOT. This is the internet of things. This is where we have a lot of different types of computer devices that are all sending and receiving information. And so they will be sending and receiving information uh, over ty different types of networking type infrastructure. So imagine in the modern world of remote workplaces, right? So you have, you may have a company where nobody actually goes into an office anymore. They are always uh, basically basically just connecting online from wherever they are. So they would have uh, services up in the cloud. So now they may have their file server that is up in the cloud. They may have their email server that's up in the cloud. They may have different types of servers that are up in the cloud. Their client machines then, uh, client machines now might be their iPhone. It might be their iPad. It might be devices like that. Some professionals nowadays don't even have laptops, right? I remember when I I was young when I was in my 20s and it was so amazing because the executives uh, all of a sudden they all got laptop computers and they no longer had desktop computers anymore. Well in the modern world many executives may not even have a laptop computer right? They may have an iPhone and the iPhone does essentially everything they needed to do. Well the iPhone can connect to the internet using 4G or 5G basically using uh, you know the cell phone signals and so in that case you need an entirely different infrastructure right? So so your, your smartphone or your executive smartphone now is going to communicate connect up to the internet using the 5G or the 4G signal and that's how they're going to be able to access their files or they're going to be able to access their email, that type of thing. You may have other uh, users uh, on the exact same network uh, and they may use uh, something like VPN services. So maybe they are sitting at their laptops uh, and they're going to use virtual private network to be able to access uh, the resources that are sitting there up on the clouds so in the remote web uh, work world, uh, there, there's a different way of building out infrastructure. But beyond work nowadays, again, we talk about IoT, we have things like cars, right? Cars are actually connected uh, to the internet at this point. Uh, so I just got a, a, got a fancy new car. It's got all kinds of computer bells and whistles to it. And one of the components uh, that it has is also uh, a, 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 a 5G, 4G type uh, antenna on it. So it can communicate up to certain 
servers on the cloud. And what's interesting now is I can have my iPhone, my iPhone can connect to the cloud, basically say that I want to turn my car on and those commands will be sent to my car and then my car will be turned on. And so this is a different type of network type infrastructure. And so that's why it's really important nowadays to be thinking about what task are you trying to accomplish because what you're trying to accomplish will dictate the types of technology that you will use. Will you use 5G? Will you use 4G? Will you use SMS? You can actually use SMS uh, for doing different types of networking tasks uh, depending on what you're trying to accomplish. Will you use fiber? Will you use coax cable? Will you use ethernet? Will you use Wi-Fi? These are all different questions that you'll have to answer based off of what problems you're trying to solve. So now that we've better conceptualized what a computer network is, we need to talk about network media. So network media is the physical connection for all of your different computer devices so that they can try to communicate. Now, a lot of times when you think about network media in the modern world, you're probably going to be thinking about Cat5 cable or possibly, if you're very lucky, Cat6 cable. So this is a standard networking cable that's been used now for tw uh, 20 years. Uh, for Ethernet that connects everything together. And so whenever you think about something like a patch cable, basically this looks like a, a large version of a telephone cable. Uh, that is probably Cat5 cable that you're going to be dealing with. That is something called a twisted pair cable. Uh, it's kind of cool stuff, uh, but that's one of the ways that you can connect uh, all of your different computer devices to the network and equipment, so on and so far and forth. Beyond that, you can use things like coax cable. Uh, so uh, especially if you're getting your internet access from your cable provider, you most likely have a coax cable that comes to your premises uh, that is then put into your cable modem, uh, which then turns the, the signal from what's used on a coax cable to using ethernet or wireless. So you can use coax cable for certain things. Uh, you can use fiber optic cable. So that's the, the cool fancy one a lot of people think about is a fiber optic cable is basically flexible glass. Uh, it's one of the fastest ways to be able to transfer for data uh, over a network and so many times fiber optic cables will be used in a standard way that, that you might use them uh, in order to connect things like buildings or to connect different server closets uh, within a single building uh, basically because it's a very fast way to be able to transfer data from these different locations. Uh, beyond that uh, obviously you have wireless connections so if you know uh, you know uh, 80211 uh, B G N AC, AX, AD, probably a couple of other ones at this point. A wireless is a way to actually be able to connect all of your computer devices. But there are also ways to connect computer devices uh, beyond uh, the standard ones that you think about, you know, whether it's Ethernet, whether it's coax cable, fiber, wireless, that type of thing. Like one of the interesting things uh, in the networking world is something called power line uh, networking, which is actually really cool. And what that does is it allows you to use electrical wiring to actually be able uh, to send network type communication. I have actually used this in the real world and it can be very useful uh, in buildings the, that are bad for, for wireless signal. So sometimes you may have a building that may have very thick walls. So when I had my business, uh, we were in Baltimore City and a lot of the buildings in Baltimore City uh, were built with really, really, really thick so thick brick walls. So you could have a wireless access point on one side of the brick wall, and then you could have your device on the other side of the brick wall, and they were not gonna communicate. <laughs> Two feet of solid brick stops a lot of Wi-Fi signal. Uh, so one of the things that we use is power line networking. These were actually adapters uh, that you would plug straight into a standard electrical outlet. And then once you had done that, it used the electrical wiring in your house as the network. You plugged in a, another adapter uh, into the exact same you know, wiring in some other place in the building, and now your computers were able to communicate with each other. Uh, there were actually tests uh, to use this at a much larger scale. Uh, where some utility companies were looking at providing internet access by literally uh, running the signal over, over the large power lines. Uh, so essentially at your house, instead of getting a cable modem or, uh, or getting a fiber optic modem, you would literally just plug your modem directly into a power outlet 
and your internet access would actually come from the power lines themselves. So there's a lot of different ways to be able to connect uh, the computer devices when you're trying to get them to communicate. Again, the standard in the modern world is usually probably gonna be Ethernet, uh, Cat5 or Cat6 cable, or, or wireless, you know, uh, 802.11n, uh, 802.11ac, 802 802.11ax, something like that, or something like a 5G signal. But again, something to be thinking about as a technology professional is that you probably have a lot more options than the standard ones that you're thinking about and using these different options might be useful in your particular environment. Again, if you're in some place like Baltimore City where they really like their brick, they really like their brick. Uh, sometimes wireless or whatever doesn't work for you. Or again, like Cat5. One of the things with Cat5 is you actually have to run the cable to all the places you wanted to go. And let me tell you, when you have to when you have to drill through two feet of brick, you start really thinking about, hmm, maybe there's a better way to be able to, to connect this networking infrastructure. So when we talk about network media, all we're talking about is that that physical layer, the physical connections of these devices so that they're able to communicate. Now that we've talked about the network media, the physical connections of all your computer devices, we now need to talk about the topologies of how you're going to design your networking infrastructure. So if you've picked up a Net Plus book or you've started to look into like an introduction to networking type class, you've probably seen topologies. And when you've seen the subject of topologies, they talk about things like token ring networks and thin net and thick net. And frankly, a lot, a lot of crap that was obsolete when I learned it 20 years ago. One of the things I will warn all of you, especially when you start worry, learning about things like networking, is many times in school or your classes, you're being taught things that I swear to you were obsolete when I was taught them 20 years ago, but for some reason they're, they're still in the syllabus and so you keep getting taught it. But what's important is not the old technologies that you're not actually going to run into, but how you think about designing your network using modern technologies that might use those quote unquote old fashioned topologies, right? And so when we talk about the topologies, there's a bus, there's a star, there's a ring, there's a mesh, there's a couple other topologies in there. So the first one to talk about is a bus type topology. So we talk about a bus type topology. Basically, this is where there is one single line for your network connection, and then your computer devices are all connected to that one single line. So again, when, when you go through, when you're taking a look at this uh, from the, that's, that's, those old obsolete classes, you will see something called thin net or thin thick net and basically with thin net or thick net uh, there were terminators at the end of of one of these bus lines. Basically, you'd have this one cable that would go through. And then especially with ThickNet, you would use something called a vampire tap. Uh, and then each computer used this vampire tap to actually connect uh, to that, that, that single networking uh, connection. And they were all able to communicate that way. I will say, I will say, I in my life have seen one single vampire tap. <laughs> I know that vampire taps did exist. Because I saw one once when my company was throwing out all that old equipment in about 2001, right? And so the whole vampire tap thing, the whole thick net thing is probably not something that you're going to have to worry about. But there is an idea here of basically thinking about how you design your network and that having a single line for your network might actually make sense, uh, especially in something like the ethernet type world. Now, to be clear here, when I talk about some, some of these subjects, sometimes I have to talk about things that are a little bit more advanced in order to explain a simpler concept. Concept. And so you may have to watch this video a couple of times to fully understand what I'm talking about. But in the Ethernet world, in the TCP IP Ethernet world, one of the interesting things that's occurred now is many times devices have an input connection for your Ethernet, your network connection, and an output 
So you can actually daisy chain or string uh, devices together. And so you may uh, have an environment where you wanna connect, let's say a lot of voice over IP telephones together. You don't wanna waste cable. And so what you could have is you could have one voice over IP uh, telephone where the wire comes in and then you have the output. So the wire goes out from there to the next voice over IP telephone. The wire goes out from that one to the next voice over IP telephone and so on and so forth. So therefore, you could end up with a bus type topology using the Ethernet type standard. That's not that's not what you're probably going to learn a lot about in class, uh, but that is one of those things that you can think of. The other thing to be thinking about too, again, in the modern world of networking in the IoT world, you might run into a bus type topology for some type of kind of non-standard networking type equipment. You might have uh, industrial automation equipment that has to be connected in a specific way that type of thing. So that's why you might run into a bus type topology in the modern world, but you probably, hopefully, hopefully you're not going to be running into any kind of uh, vampire taps. Uh, the next type of type of topology and the topology that you will normally run into uh, in, in a standard environment is called the star topology. And this is the topology that is standard uh, to be thinking about with the Ethernet, right? So when you have your, uh, your network equipment, when you have your servers, when you have your host machines, when you have your printers, when you have your voice over IP phones, your surveillance cameras, all those types of things in the modern world, World, those are most likely going to be Ethernet type devices and they all get plugged into something called a switch. So basically you have one connection from the switch to all of the devices and essentially in this topology what happens is when one computer wants to communicate with a different computer it communicates down the network cable that goes into the switch. The switch knows which port to send out the communication to the other computer and basically that's how the computers are able to communicate. So if you have different computers that want to communicate, they are connected to the switch all with a single wire and then it ends up, you know, at the end of the day, basically kind of looking like a star and that's kind of the standard uh, topology that you're going to be dealing with. Uh, that you then also have uh, what's called the a ring topology. So normally, again, when you're doing introduction to networking, you're going to hear something about a token ring network. And so what a token ring network was is basically you had the wiring for your network and it was in a loop. And then what, that, what happened is there was actually a token that was used in this type of networking and a computer could only communicate if it currently had access to the token. So there was one token that, that, that constantly looped in this type of network and then if a computer needed to communicate, they could grab that token, basically say what information they needed from which computer on the network and then that would go to the computer it was looking for, right? So you had all these different computers connected to a token ring network so if this computer want to communicate with this computer up here, uh, basically when the token came to it, it would say, hey, I need to communicate with that particular host machine. Then that token would go to that host machine. That host machine would give the information that was requested and then it would go back uh, to the first one. A uh, token ring, again, I don't know, you go back 20 or 30 years, uh, it was very valuable for uh, industrial automation type systems. Um, the Ethernet standard, what we currently use today, has issues. Uh, it has issues with how it was designed. There's something called collision detection. We'll get into this in an entirely different class. But basically, how Ethernet is designed at its very, very fundamental level, there are a lot of issues with how uh, computers are able to communicate with each other. And there are a lot of times when you can have quirky type problems. Now, to be clear, when you're sending emails, when you're watching YouTube videos, whatever else, the Ethernet standard is fine. Uh, one of the problems you get into though is again, in an industrial type setting, when you have robots uh, and you have equipment that are all doing very dangerous tasks and they're supposed to be communicating with each other, uh, if you have the uh, <clears throat> quirks of the Ethernet standard, it, honestly, you might get somebody killed, right? Because if you if the network doesn't respond appropriately for 30 seconds for some reason, and one robot is supposed to do something based off of what a different robot does, 
that everything can kind of go to hell. So that's that's why token ring used to be very important because token ring always made sure that all of your devices were able to communicate in a timely fashion and you wouldn't get some of the blow ups that you get on the ethernet standard. The thing is, you know, time goes by, time does go by. It's been 20 or 30 years. Ethernet is a hell of a lot better than it used to be. It's, it's not, to be clear, it's not that those fundamental problems have gone away. It's just the equipment nowadays is so good, it's able to handle those fundamental problems. So at this point in time, you're most likely not going to see a token ring network, but the topology uh, of a ring can actually be very useful. Uh, so when I was researching in order to do this class, uh, one of the things that came up was basically the idea of cameras in a municipal environment. So, you know, um, Oh, uh, you know, police police departments uh, nowadays, they use cameras uh, a lot of times at intersections in order to catch speeders or people that are running red lights or for, uh, you know, in order to detect crime, that type of thing. Well, one of the things to be thinking about in that type of environment is that if you had to run a cable from each uh, camera that was put up in a city, uh, basically all the way back to a home office, uh, so essentially that, like that st star topology that I just showed you, that would require a lot of cable, right? This isn't, this is not in a building. <laughs> This isn't a whole city, right? So each one of these runs might be miles and miles and miles and miles. So even with the Ethernet standard, one of the things that can be done is you can actually create a ring uh, in order to make it so that you do not need uh, so much wiring to be able to connect uh, all of these cameras together. So essentially you have the police station or the, wherever the city hall is, uh, you have the connection from that city hall that comes out to the first camera. Then from the first camera, instead of going all the way back to City Hall or whatever, you can just go to the second camera, then go to the third camera, then go to the fourth camera, then to go to the fifth camera, then go to the sixth camera, and then you can go back to the police station or whatever else. And then here you wind up with a ring topology that might be useful for the specific problems that you're dealing with, right? So that's one of the topologies that's out there. The final topology uh, to talk about is a mesh topology. So a mesh topology is where your computer devices are actually connected to multiple other computer devices so that if one connection goes down, they'll still be able to communicate, right? So uh, in most of these other uh, designs, topologies that I've talked about, your computer had or computer device has one connection uh, to, to the rest of everything else. In a mesh topology, uh, again, that you actually have multiple connections so that if there's any problems, your computer devices will still be able to communicate with the other computer device. So like with this, uh, let's say, I don't know, for some reason, this connection goes down right here. Uh, so basically, uh, in this situation, if this computer needs to communicate with this computer, it could then actually route the route the communication uh, to this computer over here and then send, send it back even though the, the main connection between those computers has failed. Now, when you look at mesh communication now in the modern world, it's most likely not the individual devices that will be using mesh communication, uh, but you'll actually see mesh communication for the networking devices themselves. Uh, so in my house, I use something called Orbi uh, devices. So these are, these are uh, wireless network equipment from Netgear, and they actually create their own mesh network. So I have multiple of these uh, these little satellite access points that are set up that are able to communicate back to my base router uh, that then gets me to the internet, right? If one of these devices fails, uh, all of my other IoT devices that are on my premises are able to communicate with a different access point and they're able to get out to the internet that way. So normally when you hear about a mesh topology in the modern world, you're most likely going to be hearing about this from uh, the networking equipment 
equipment. You'll hear about wireless mesh, that type of thing. That's at the actual networking level, uh, not generally with the individual devices themselves. And so these are some of the things to be thinking about uh, basically when we start talking about the network topology. The final thing to realize though is that when you're talking about the network topology is you have a physical uh, topology and a logical topology. And this is one of the things, again, in the real world can get a little bit confusing. So back in the day, one of the things that I used to install 15 years ago uh, were surveillance cameras. <laughs> Those used to be a great profit margin. Not so much anymore. Anyways, what had an amazing profit margin were the PTZ cameras. They're called pan tilt uh, zoom cameras. You've probably seen them. They look they, they look basically like robotic cameras that can follow people around. Uh, that type of deal. Um, and so basically, uh, when we went into industrial environments, uh, many times our clients would have us put up multiple of these pan tilt zoom cameras uh, so that they could surveil what was going on, what was going on with their warehouses, uh, what was going on with their their, their 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 trucking facilities when the trucks would come in and park that type of deal well when you were dealing uh, with these types of cameras you had the connection to the camera itself that used a coax cable so there's something called a Siamese cable that connected your camera to your digital video recorder, basically the, the server uh, for, for your video feed. But on top of that, you actually had to have an entirely different type of communication to uh, the pan tilt zoom component uh, of those cameras. And so there was something called a PTZ protocol. And uh, the PTZ protocol that we used required a ring type topology. <laughs> which really sucked. So you think about this, and again, you're in some kind of warehouse area, and you have, uh, oops, you have uh, one, you know, one camera that's at the top of a light pole. Uh, then you have another camera uh, that's at the top of a warehouse, and then you have another camera somewhere else. And one of the issues with this is with this this uh, this PTZ uh, equipment is it required a ring topology, so everything had to be connected in a ring. And one of the problems you could run into is as these PTZ cameras were connected into a ring, is if somebody came through with with a, a forklift that was too high, or warehouse workers do what warehouse workers do, or rats or squirrels. One of the things to realize, again, dealt with this in the real world, rodents, rodents love to eat wiring. So the problem was, right, what happens if, you know, somewhere in this big ring where you've got all this wiring running everywhere, a rodent just decides to, to eat one of the control wires? And now all of a sudden, you have to troubleshoot this mess. And we start troubleshooting. Again, you're over a large warehouse facility, and it can become very difficult just to understand where you should start troubleshooting at. And so one of the things that we learned, again, we start talking about the difference between a physical and logical, is that although the PTZ equipment required a physical ring uh, topology, what we could do is we could actually turn that into a logical star topology. And so what will you do is you would have the main office with all the uh, the surveillance equipment, the 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 the, uh, the, the recorder and and the, the the TVs and that type of thing. And what you would do is you would run one cable out to the camera, and then from the output of the camera you would run that all the way back to the office, and then you would run then you would go out to the next camera. And then you'd run it all the way back to the office. And then you run out to the next camera and all the way back to the office. Run out to the next camera and all the way back to the office. And so physically, it is a loop. Because again, if you do this, you pull it all the way out and it ends up being a circle. But logically, you can then turn it into a star. And so why this is useful then is because if you get a failure on one of these lines, again, a mouse eats it or whatever else, this this is a hell of a lot easier to troubleshoot, right? I can put I can put a testing equipment here and testing equipment here, and then see see if if I get a signal. Uh, if 
I do, I go on to the next, next line and see if that works. If it doesn't, I then know this is where the issue is. Beyond it becoming very easy to fix the problem, what this also means is that, that if for some reason I can't fix the problem, maybe it'll take a couple of weeks to go out there to actually rerun the cable. Again, something that happens in the real world. What I can do is I can simply just take that, that part of the loop out and all of the other network, the, all the other PTZ cameras will still be able to function uh, properly. And so again, this is one of those things that you need to be thinking about in the networking world, not simply what the physical topology is, but can you modify that or to, to or what the logical topology is, but can you modify that in such a way that in your particular environment, it will be easier for troubleshooting and that type of deal. And so when we're talking about topologies, all we're talking about is the, is the layout of the wiring and such for your network. Again, token ring and vampire taps and all that kind of stuff is was, was old when I learned that crap back in 2000, but the basic concepts of topologies can still be very useful in the modern world. So now that we've talked about the media that will physically connect our computer devices, and we've talked about the topologies, which is the actual design, the layout of our network, the next thing that we need to talk about are the protocols. And so when we start talking about protocols, especially with new people, people get very confused because there are a lot of different types of protocols out there. And so when people start talking about all these different types of protocols, you know, poor people's brains explode and it's, it's a really bad thing, right? So the first thing to understand when we're talking about protocols is what is a protocol? And all a protocol is, is it's the language that it's used by computer devices in order to communicate, right? So when you have different computer devices and they're trying to do different things, they need to be able to communicate with each other. And the protocol is the language that is used for these devices to be able to communicate. The issue that, that we run into where people get confused used is that there are multiple different types of protocols out there. And so people start trying to figure out how all these protocols kind of come together. And the issue is, is that there are actually different types of protocols that should be thought of in different ways. Uh, so the first one to be thinking about is a networking protocol. So the networking protocol is uh, that you're going to be using is most likely TCP IP version four. And so this is how the computers on your device are actually able to communicate with each other. This is the protocol that is used, the language that is used so that your client computer can communicate with a server and be able to get back whatever information it is that they need. Uh, it allows you to be able to watch a video if you're watching this video online. It allows you to share files, upload files, download files. It allows you to do a lot of different types of things. But the main uh, type of protocol that most people think about are, are these networking uh, protocols. And again, it's TCPI IP version four uh, or a CCP IP version six. Uh, those are the protocols, but there are other protocols that are out there. Uh, one of the types of protocols that exist are called routing protocols. So you may have heard of border gateway protocol, BGP. You may have heard of OSPF, open shortest path first. You may have heard of RIP. You may have heard a lot of these different um, routing protocols and what these routing protocols are for is for your routers for your networking equipment to be able to communicate with each other and be able to determine the best route uh, for the networking protocols to use so that your computers are able to communicate with each other so when you look at the internet uh, or when you look at a large scale infrastructure an enterprise type, type infrastructure you have a lot of routers you have a lot of switches you have a lot of different networking equipment that all that's all connected together. All of that equipment has to figure out the route uh, for your computer to be able to communicate with whatever it's trying to communicate with. And so routing protocols are used in order to create those connections. But that's something that's generally more advanced and something that you don't need to be thinking about yet, but that is a type of protocol. Beyond that, you have things like storage protocols. So you may have heard of something called iSCSI. Uh, so what iSCSI allows is basically a host machine to be able to use 
use a server literally as a remote hard drive. Uh, essentially, as far as that host machine is concerned, uh, basically the, the storage on that server uh, looks logically as if it's actually connected to the host machine. And so this can be used uh, in order to store large files. It might be used if you do a lot of video editing. Uh, so let's say you have multiple people that are going to be uh, editing videos, all right, something like Linus Tech Tips or whatever. They may actually use a storage protocols so their host machines can communicate with their storage arrays where everything is stored and be able to communicate it properly. But that's a storage protocol. Again, something you probably don't need to worry about right now. It's important to understand that it exists. Beyond that, there's electronics protocol. So if you follow uh, my work dealing with my little robotic cars, uh, dealing with Raspberry Pis, those types of things, one of the things you'll, one of the, the types of devices that I use for those types of projects projects um, are I2C uh, components. So I2C components act are actually an electronics protocol uh, that what this allows you to do is it allows you to put up to 100, I think it's 126 different electronics devices onto your little Raspberry Pi. Uh, these can be sensors, these can be OLED screens, they can be all kinds of different things. And basically it allows you to be able to communicate with all of those different electronics components within your electronics project uh, to, to accomplish whatever it is that you're going to accomplish. Again, with sensors, outputs, all of that type of thing. And that, so that is an electronics protocol. And so it's just important to understand when we start talking about protocols, because the important one to be thinking about for most people is gonna be the networking protocol. And that's where you're gonna be dealing with TCP IP version four or TCP IP version six. This is where you may be dealing with uh, ARP, uh, address resolution protocol, ICMP, SNMP, STMP, and there's a whole bunch of different protocols, but that's all within the, the networking uh, protocol type world. It's not the routing protocols. It's not the storage protocols. It's not the electronics protocols. So all a protocol is, it is the language that is used by your computer devices so that they can communicate in order to do certain tasks. And for you right now, focus on the networking protocols, all the TCP IP stuff, and don't worry so much about these other protocols at this point in time. So now that we've talked about the basic concept of what a protocol is, so this is the language that computers use in order to communicate with each other to do whatever tasks, let's talk a little bit more about networking protocols. So that's gonna be one of the things that you're gonna to have to dig into as obviously you're gonna start learning more about computer networking. So the protocol that most of us use in the modern world is something called TCP IP version four. So with this particular uh, protocol, there's a lot of uh, terms that you've probably heard before. Uh, it uses an IP address. It uses something called a subnet mask. It uses a, uh, a default gateway. It is something called a routable protocol. So you can actually separate uh, TCP IP into multiple different networks and then communicate uh, with those different networks through routers. Uh, it uses DNS, uh, do domain name services, in order to map um, fully qualified domain names. So things like CNN.com, FoxNews.com, or whatever else to to an IP address, right? All of that kind of thing is built into the TCP IP4 uh, networking protocol. And that's mainly what you're gonna be used uh, be using and learning. But there all are different networking protocols out there. And in my, you know, 20 plus years uh, in the uh, in the IT world, I have had to use these other networking protocols. Uh, there's a, a networking protocol that used to be around something called IPX SPX. Uh, so this was a networking protocol that allowed computers to be able to communicate with each other. It was a routable protocol uh, that was used uh, in the Novell realm. Again, that's basically long dead at this point. Uh, but if you ever heard the term IPX SPX, that was a routable protocol. There was something called NetBuoy. There was something called Bonjour. There was something called Apple Talk. There's a whole bunch of different networking protocols out there that you may run into, uh, but generally it's gonna be TCP IP version four. You will hear about IP version six. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna hear about that. <laughs> and, uh, you're probably still not gonna use it. Uh, TCP IP version six, this is the next version of the TCP IP that we were supposed to be moving to that was going to make TCP IP version four obsolete. And that was what I was told back in 2000. 
And it's now, as I do this video, it's 2022, and we're still using TCP IP version four. It's important to understand uh, TCP IP version six is a hell of a lot different from the configuration realm uh, than TCP IP version four, but the reality is, is you're just most likely not going to be running into it, at least for another, I don't know, decade. It's funny, it's funny. I did a class, I literally recorded one of these classes back, I think it was like 2009, it was like 2009 or 2010. And I said, well, maybe in 2020, we'll be on IPv6. It's now, it's now 2022. We're not on IPv6. So it's just one of those things that, that, that you may have to learn about in the future, or you may not. The important things with these networking protocols is that there are going to be configurations that you may have to do to make these networking protocols work. Again, when you're dealing with TCP IP version four, uh, you're going to have your IP address. Your IP address is a number that essentially identifies your computer on the network. It should, <laughs> cross your fingers, it should be unique on the network. And so that's how the network knows how to route communication. Again, file, emails, that type of thing, because it's going to try to route to a specific IP address. And so you configure your IP address. Uh, the subnet mask, this gets a little bit more complicated. Basically the subnet mask tells the computer where the number for the network ends and where the host ID begins. So when you have uh, your, your IP address, let's say 192.168.1.10, right? If you have a 255.255.255.0 subnet mask, basically what that subnet mask tells the computer is that the th first three octets, 192.168.1, that that's your network ID, and that the final dot ten is your host, is your computer ID, um, and that's one of the the components for how TCP/IP version four works. Again, we will talk about this later, and you'll fall asleep later. You will pretend to follow my subnetting class later. Uh, beyond that, with TCP IP version four, it is something called a routable protocol. So again, you can have multiple different networks. They can communicate with each other using something called a router. So there's uh, when you do the configuration, the configuration for what is the default gateway, what that says is if you, if you're trying to communicate with a computer and it's not located on the local network, go to this router to communicate with the wider network to see if it's out there. That's a configuration with TCP IP version four. You have your DNS, your primary and secondary uh, DNS servers. You configure that with TCP IP version four. And so basically the important thing to understand here when you're dealing with these networking protocols is that there's going to be specific configurations that are going to be required for whatever protocol that you're going to use. And so essentially you're just gonna to need to know how those, how those conf configurations work out, and also uh, whether or not the, the protocol that you're using uh, will, will do the task that you need it to do, uh, or if you need to figure out a different solution. Again, this may be important in the IoT world, the, the Internet of Things world. You may have a bunch of IoT devices in your infrastructure. They may use their own protocol. So when you're talking about protocols, protocols are, are basically software like anything else, just like you have an operating system, just like you have a web browser and people can build different operating systems and build different web browsers. People can also write different protocols. I know people that have written at different protocols in order to accomplish different tasks. And so in your IoT world, you may have a proprietary protocol. You may have a protocol that nobody else uses that, that has its own configurations that are required in order to allow all of those, those computing devices to be able to communicate with each other. And so it's just important to understand. It's like, oh, okay. So these devices use this weird ass protocol. This weird ass protocol requires these configurations. And so then you just sit down and type out the configurations, right? If you kind of grasp that concept, life is gonna be easy for you. So the next concept that we need to talk about, when we're talking about this whole introduction to networking, is the concept of speed and the concept of latency. So a lot of times, uh, new people, uh, when they're building out their networks or when they're building out their infrastructure, they hyper-focus on the concept of speed. They don't think about latency at all. They then build out their infrastructure and it doesn't do what they needed to do, and they don't understand why. So what you need to be thinking about when you think about the difference between speed and latency 
consistency is when you're talking about speed, basically we're talking about how long it takes a data to get from point A to point B. And so imagine you have a server, right? You have some kind of web server and on that web server you have some kind of movie file, right? You want to download a movie from iTunes and let's say that movie file is uh, three gigs in size. So you need to move that file from the server uh, to your client machine. And so when you download the file, uh, you measure how long it takes and then you realize you get one gigabit uh, per second uh, in speed. So this is like a fiber optic line. So you're able to download that movie uh, very quickly. The thing is, with speed is you look at the overall time it takes to download a file and that's how you measure the speed. But sometimes if you have really crap latency or if you have a really weird network for some reason, if you actually look at how that file gets downloaded, uh, sometimes the speed will be very high and then the speed will drop off and then the speed is high again and then the speed drops off again and then the speed gets high again and then the speed drops off again. And so at the end, overall you get a one gigabit per second uh, in download speed but sometimes you're getting one you're getting possibly higher than one gigabit per second in download speeds and then you know as it goes sometimes it drops off to almost nothing then it goes up again then it goes down then it goes up again then it goes down then it goes up again then it goes down the problem that you can run into is with things like real-time communications uh, having these kinds of ups and downs doesn't work out very well. Again, think about this. If you're downloading a movie file, if you're downloading a software package, as long as the overall speed is fast, you're happy. But imagine if you're trying to do essentially telephone calls. Imagine if you're doing voice over IP, or imagine you're doing a video communication, or imagine you're playing video games, right? And so information is being sent up and being sent down. That's where we get into the concept of latency. And so latency is the speed of, that it takes to go from the server to your host machine back to the host server. And so generally with this, you're looking at things uh, with latency, you want less than 20 milliseconds for like voice over IP. So if you're you're talking on the phone, uh, basically you want how long it takes uh, data to get from your host machine to the server to be uh, 20 milliseconds. That is actually fast for the, the amount of information that's going to be sent. So when you're looking at latency uh, with voice over IP, 20 milliseconds is good, uh, 150 milliseconds to get from your host machine to the server or wherever it's going, uh, that is enough to be noticeable. Uh, 300 milliseconds is basically unusable, it, it becomes worthless. And so one of the things to be thinking about whenever you're, you're specking out your networking infrastructure, how you're gonna be connecting to the internet, is looking at how how fast that latency will be and you might realize although you get a one gigabit per second connection the latency is so bad it becomes worthless to you uh, this is really uh, predominant in the satellite internet world right so you probably heard of SpaceX uh, sending up their satellites and so with SpaceX they have what is called low orbit satellites and so they're re relatively close uh, to to the planet and so the latency on those is pretty small so you can actually do voice over ip communication and that type of thing over a SpaceX low orbit satellite. The old fashioned uh, satellites actually had a much higher orbit, so it took a lot longer from communication to get from the Earth up to the satellite and back down again. And so this latency here, the length of time it took to get from point A to P, point B was so long, uh, you couldn't do voice over IP communication. You couldn't even do VPN services. Again, things to be thinking about, uh, virtual private networking requires a relatively relatively stable, solid networking connection, uh, VPN would not work over these uh, higher orbit uh, internet type connections because the latency was so high. And so this is something that you may have to be thinking about for your particular environment. Uh, you may look at something like a DSL connection, right? In the modern world, <laughs> why would I use a DSL connection? Like 1.5 megabits per second or maybe five megabits per second on a DSL connection, that's seems stupid, but depending on what you're doing with your network, right, a five megabit per second connection with very low latency 
might actually be more effective uh, for whatever it is that you are trying to accomplish. And so this is something you need to be thinking about with your network. Are you just simply uploading and downloading files? I think about this with gas stations. I used to have clients uh, that ran gas stations and their accounting software actually used these high orbit satellites in order to communicate back with their headquarters. But all they were literally all they were doing was uploading the receipts for the day. So it didn't really matter what the hell the latency was, right? As long as the communication would actually work, they uploaded uh, their their receipts for the day, got downloaded to headquarters. Headquarters would run the numbers to say whether they were doing good or whether they were doing bad. So in that particular environment, uh, latency like literally didn't matter at all. Uh, on the other hand, again, if you're using voice over IP, latency can be very, very important, especially nowadays. Uh, many companies are going over to voice over IP, that's software as a service. So instead of even having voice over IP located on their premises, some kind of VoIP server on their premises, many are now using like, like a company called Nextiva, where they actually outsource all of their telephone services up to the cloud. And so whenever anybody's trying to communicate, whenever anybody's trying to use a telephone line, everything has to go back up to the cloud and down again. In that type of situation, if you have poor latency, all of a sudden, <laughs> Your telephones just aren't going to be working, so you can run into a big problem. So this is something to be thinking about there. Again, people hyper-focus on the whole concept of speed. Many times, a slower speed with a better latency will actually do better for whatever type of network you're trying to build out. So we just talked about speed and latency, and I was discussing, you know, if you need to download a three gigabyte file from the internet and you have a, a one gigabit per second connection and talking about the latency and all of that. And one of the questions that you probably came up to you is, huh, why does it seem like my internet connection is so slow, right? If I have a, a three gigabyte file and I have a one gigabit uh, per second connection, shouldn't it take three seconds to download this file? And however fast it is, it sure as hell ain't three seconds. And the reason for that is, is one, is that when you talk about file size, the size of files, you talk about bytes. And when you talk about the speed of internet or networking connections, you talk about bits. Why is this? I would argue it's because marketing people are evil and they know most consumers don't realize the difference. So when we talk about bytes and bits, essentially what you have to realize is that there are eight bits in one byte, right? So basically when you get into to how data is actually stored, you have bits and you have bytes. So eight bits equals one byte. So if you're downloading, let's say uh, a three giga, uh, gigabyte file down a, a one gigabit per second connection, essentially what you should do is you should multiply that file size by, by, by eight. Uh, so 24, think about it as 24, and then that will give you a better amount of time for how long it should take to download. So theoretically it might take like 30 seconds or so. So that's the first thing to realize, right? Uh, networking speed is in bits, <laughs> storage size is in bytes, again, I would argue because marketing people are evil. Uh, beyond that though, there's also uh, overhead. Uh, so whenever you're downloading a file or basically whenever you're doing communication on a network, there's more communication going on than you see, right? So basically, uh, when information is sent from the server to your host computer, uh, there, there's a lot of communication back and forth uh, to make sure that, that you have actually received the data that you were supposed to receive, right? So the server sends data to your, to your computer, and then your computer says, yes, I received that data. Because of networking issues, problems on the internet, whatever else, sometimes the server will send data to your local host, and then your 
computer doesn't respond because it didn't receive the data. And so then the server has to resend uh, the data that it just sent, and then it gets a response saying that that data was received before it sends off the, the next set of data that it's supposed to send, right? So you have issues like that where you just simply don't see it as the user using the computer. Uh, beyond that, there's, there's overhead for the communication. So uh, when you're sending data, you actually, uh, there's something called a packet. There's packets and frames. We'll talk about those in a different class. Uh, but, but basically, uh, the packets and frames, they have headers. Uh, they have information on the destination, where the data is supposed to go to. There, there's IP address headers. There's MAC address. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other information with the data that you're being sent. So not only are you being sent the movie file data, but you're sent, being sent all of this additional data to get that movie file from point A to point B. And so those are the reasons when you get that one gigabit per second in a connection and you're downloading files and it still seems like it takes a little too long to download the files, the first is because, uh, again, the, the, the speed is in bits, not bytes. File storage is in bytes. And then you've got the overhead and all kinds of stuff going on in the networking realm. Uh, and that's why uh, things may be slower than it seems like they should be. Now, one of the final things uh, to talk about in the networking world is the difference between the physical and the logical uh, with networking. So this was brought up before and when I was talking about topologies and I was talking about the concept of the ring topology. And so logically, you have a ring uh, topology, but then physically, you actually make it a star, right? So again, with uh, those pan, tilt, zoom cameras in order to be able to control those things, instead of, instead of the wire going Going specifically from one camera to the next to the next to the next I would actually have the, the the wire go from the camera back to the home office out to the next camera back out to the next camera back out to the next camera back so on and so forth and so that way I was able to design that infrastructure uh, so that it worked because in order to work it had to logically be a uh, a, a ring uh, topology, uh, but physically I built it in such a way to be a star so that if there were any problems, again, a, a mouse ate through one of the cables, the entire system did not fail. Uh, and so the idea of physical and logical becomes very important in the networking world. Again, when you start uh, diagramming out what a network looks like, right, you're going to have the cloud, you're going to have the internet, uh, and then basically in your premises, you're going to have a modem, the modem is generally what connects to the internet. Uh, in there, you're going to have a router. A router uh, basically uh, routes traffic from the local uh, network out to the to the wide area network, basically out to the network. Uh, on the router, you may have a wireless access point. So the wireless access point allows your iPhones and your laptop computers and all that kind of stuff to be able to wirelessly connect to the network. On top of that, you will have a switch. And so the switch allows you to physically connect devices to your network. Uh, so your desktop computers, uh, your, 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 your printers, your, your hardwired printers, that type of thing may be connected to the switch. And so all of these are different logical devices, right? You have a modem, you have a router, you have a wireless access point, you have a switch, and you probably have a couple of other things. The thing is, in the real world, when you're dealing with physical devices in the networking world, most of the time, all of that would be just simply be built into one physical device, right? So this right here uh, is an old Airport Extreme, an Apple Airport Extreme uh, wireless router. And this wireless router has uh, all those components other than the modem built into this. So this has a router built into this. It has a wireless access point built into it. It has a switch switch to be able to con uh, connect uh, physical devices into it. Uh, it even has a file server built into it, right? And so an important thing to be thinking about is you may sit down and you might diagram how your network is going to look like. And that is, that is logically how the network is going to look. But then physically, it may literally be one box that you pull out of a package and plug in. When you're designing your infrastructure, when you're troubleshooting your infrastructure, you need to be thinking about your infrastructure as it logically functions. And then once you can figure out where you think the problem is, then you go to the actual physical device and then you try to troubleshoot what's going on.
So the difference between the logical world and the physical world in networking can be very massive. And so if you think about how everything connects logically and then figure out the physical component, life is going to be a lot easier for you. So there you go, a nice simple class on what is computer networking. We talked about the media, how all the devices are, are connected to each other, whether it's through coax cable, cat5 cable, fiber, wireless, whatever else. We talked about the topology, how they're all physically connected. Is it a bus? Is it a star? Uh, is it a ring? We talked about the difference between uh, the physical topology and the logical topology and somehow how those need to be different. We talked about the different protocols. So protocols are the language that is used by computers in order to be able to communicate in order to do certain tasks. Again, networking protocols, TCP IP version 4, IP version 6, IPX, SPX. These are the things that allow your computers to communicate the way that you're thinking. But then beyond that, there are routing protocols that allow networking uh, equipment to communicate with each other. There are storage protocols such as iSCSI uh, that allow uh, remote servers to essentially be used logically as if they're a local storage to a computer. We talked about uh, the electronics protocol I2C that I use a lot for my little uh, Raspberry Pi pro uh, project. And so again, the important thing to understand with protocols is just figure out what protocol you're using and then, then re read how you're supposed to use it and then do it. A, a lot of new people get very confused with protocols because basically they try to reinvent the wheel. They, they have this idea that they can argue with a piece of networking equipment that somehow if they very large, logically state their case to that networking equipment, that that networking equipment will agree and give up. <laughs> That's not how computers work, right? So basically, you look at what protocol you're using, you read the information on how that protocol works, and then you just type in the configurations that you need. Uh, beyond that, we talked about speed and latency. Again, speed is the overall speed it takes uh, like something like a file to get from point A to point B. Latency is actually like on the packet level, uh, going back and forth, again, 20 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, whatever else. Um, and that sometimes you actually need higher latency and that speed is not necessarily important. Again, a very low speed DSL connection uh, uh, with very low latency, so you want that latency to be as low as possible, uh, might actually be more useful to you than a gigabit per second connection with a, an insanely high latency. Uh, or on the other hand, the you may not care about the latency. You may be running something like a gas station where you just have to upload your receipts at the end of the day. So you know, as, as long as you're able to connect to the to the servers back at headquarters. You don't care how long the latency is, uh, but latency is it's it is important for things like in the modern world, like real time communication uh, uh, for VPN services, virtual private networking services. It's incredibly important. So you really do have to look at what you're trying to accomplish with your network to determine is speed important or is latency. Again, when we're talking about that speed. Again, the difference between bits and bytes. There's eight bits and one byte. Storage is measured in bytes. Speed is measured in bits because marketing people are evil. So just remember, when you're looking at it, more or less eight times. So again, if you've got a three, you know, if you've got a three gigabyte file and you've got one gigabits per second, maybe multiply by three or whatever. I don't know, horseshoes and hand grenades that might get you to where the, the speed is. Uh, but again, on top of the whole bit and byte thing, you do also have overhead. So the communication between your local host and the server that's communicating with, there's more communication going on than simply the file being downloaded. And one of the things you also have to be thinking about when you're downloading files from the internet is is you don't know, oh, you don't know the quality of the network you're going through. So you may have a gigabit per second connection to the internet, but then the network that the server is connected to might be hot trash. So, right? <laughs> That might be garbage. Uh, other problems you can run into, you will notice this if you're a video gamer and you try to download uh, download games on the first day that they're available. Sometimes the servers themselves will become a bottleneck where the server may have a hundred you know, gigabit per second connection to the internet, so it should be fine. But when you have three million people all trying to download the same file at once, everything comes to a screeching halt for everybody. If one person tried to download the file, 
it would be lickety split. But when you have 3 million people or millions of people trying to download the same file from the same server at the exact same time, everything can become very slow. And so those are some of the things to be thinking about, you know, speed and latency and how fast it really takes things to get from point A to point B. And then finally, again, with this, and again, we're talking about networking. Uh, an important thing to really understand with computer networking in the modern world is just there's a tremendous number of ways computer devices can communicate with each other. Again, they can have hardwire connections, fiber optic, coax, you can have power line they may not have thought about. You can actually use uh, the electrical wires in your house a as a networking media. Uh, but beyond that, you know, one of the interesting uh, types of networking that's come out in the past few years is actually using light. I don't see it having a lot of practical application, but it is important to understand that Li-Fi exists. So Li-Fi is actually using light to be able to send and receive data. I've gone to CES many times. I've seen them progress with Li-Fi technology, and I can tell you it's pretty cool and it's pretty stable. I don't really know what the hell you'd use it for, <laughs> but it exists. And what this is, is basically they can use a light bulb. So they have a light bulb that can communicate with a normal wired network. And then the light actually pulses and you can have an, a, a, a photo receiver on your device. So like a tablet, you know, some kind of computer tablet like that, that can actually pick up uh, the pulses of light coming out. And that tablet can actually get information from that light source. Why would you use it in the real world? I don't know. <laughs> Uh, it, it might be it might be useful in, in cybersecurity. Uh, so when you use uh, Wi-Fi, so when you use you know 802.11 G N A C A X, you know standard wireless equipment uh, that uses radio waves. So if you are in a military application and you were worried about espionage from the enemy, right? Having communication and radio waves, those radio waves can leak out. Out, and the enemy might be able to pick up those radio waves to, to understand what you're going to be doing, basically picking up communication. So one of the reasons that Li-Fi might, I, I'm just putting this out there, I'm just putting it out as a possibility. One of the reasons Li-Fi might be useful is that if you wanted some type of wireless communication within a facility, but you didn't want to have to worry about radio frequency leaking out, if you had light bulbs that were sending the information essentially wirelessly to the devices, then all you would have to do is make sure none of the light leaked out of the facility. So you might put the facility underground or you might just have a big warehouse facility where there's no windows to it. And so that way you can have wireless communication that would be more secure from eavesdropping than Wi-Fi signal. <laughs> Again, I'm not saying that I would use it, but it's a possibility. Right, And so, again, these are the things that you need to be thinking about as a modern technology professional and thinking about all the problems and you've got to be thinking about all the possible solutions and you, you might find out what you think of as a really old technology or, or a really crappy technology it might be the best way for doing network communication. I think about this in the modern world right now with all these IoT devices with SMS messaging. Right, so SMS messaging, you know the old the old text messages, right? Uh, you may not think about this as a way to do networking, but if you have a lot of sensors in a lot of different places, um, the the information that they need to send, you may not need a gigabit per second. You may not need amazing latency. You just may need the temperature reading, right? Imagine, imagine if you have a farm. Imagine if you have a farm and you're trying to figure out how to water everything in the farm. And so all you want is little IoT sensors spread around your farm that collect the temperature readings throughout the day. Maybe they collect temperature readings. Maybe they crack, uh, collect a soil moisture sensor readings. And that's all they do, right? Well, a text message, right? So basically what, what you could have that little device do is it could send a text message with the device identifier. So it could say, this is sensor, 
whatever sensor number it is, hyphen, and then this is the current temperature, hyphen, this is the current you know, moisture uh, detection or whatever, hyphen, whatever other information, and that could be sent up to a service such as Twilio, something like that, some server online. Uh, that information could be parsed, and then based off of what that information is, you could have some kind of automatic watering system that says, okay, we need to water these fields right now and not water those fields because they already have enough moisture, right? Again, this is the really cool and interesting thing with the modern world of technology is we are not simply dealing with host computer. We're not simply dealing with Windows 95, connecting to an exchange server and being able to print things on a printer, right? That's, that's 20 years ago. What we have now is all these wacky ass sensors uh, and, and different types of devices that are all trying to communicate in order to solve specific problems. And so in this world, having light bulbs, you know, do the, do the network connectivity or using SMS messaging. There's all kinds of different ways these di different devices can communicate to solve the problems that you need to solve. So uh, that's really all I've got for this particular class today. I hope you understand a little bit more about what computer networking is. As always, I enjoy teaching this class and I look forward to seeing the next one.